the Geologic Society. Oh, okay, someone's recorded. Okay. Um, tonight we have another wonderful talk uh, for us. Um, but before we get to the talk, a couple of things we have to take care of. Um, it, the standard format that we've been using for quite a long time. Um, uh, if you have questions, please use the question and answer um, down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, in addition, if, for those of you that are joining by phone, uh, at the end, we will unmute you to see if you have any questions. Also, uh, use raise, uh, raise hand icon to enter for the questions. Um, also, uh, use that icon to report any technical issues. Um, there's also a chat option that allows you to message all other part participants to see and feel free to use that before the lecture starts to greet others, uh, all participants and attendees. Okay, a couple other things. Um, as with all of our lectures, this, this lecture is free and open to the public. You do not have to be a GSM member. If you are not a GSM member in the chat, uh, please tell us where you are from and how you heard about us. We, we really want to know. Also, uh, we can see how many devices are watching, but we do not have any way to know how many people there are watching. So if you could uh, put in that chat box, hey, I got four people here or five people, whatever the case may be, that would help us out to give us an idea how many people are actually listening to this lecture. But but uh, only do that if you're more than one. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Okay. Um, also, if you um, can use these uh, uh, this time for continuing ed credits, uh, just let us know. Put put that in the chat. And we will send you out a form so that you can get those continuing ed credits. Okay. Uh, tonight, uh, we have Stephen Semke, PhD Professor, School of Earth Science and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. Um, he's going to give us a, a great talk on uh, young rocks of uh, the Grand Canyon, um, or the old rocks of Grand Canyon. Um, old rocks, young canyon, yeah. Yes, sorry. All right. Um, everyone had the bibliography and abstract, so I'm not going to reread everything for that. I'm just going to turn it over to Steve and let him go. All right. Thank you, Roger. And thanks to Dave and Steve for the invitation. Let me share my screen here. And hopefully, momentarily, you will see the first slide. Okay, can you uh, can you see that slide, Roger or Dave? Yes, we yeah. can see it. Okay, see it. all right. Well, thank you. I, I'll take care of them. Thanks a lot. So yeah, I'm happy to be here. My name's Steve Semkin. I'm a professor of geology and education in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. And of course, Arizona is the Grand Canyon State. But besides that, I happen to do a great deal of my work in and around Grand Canyon and. Uh, uh, just uh, yesterday it was, I think yesterday or Saturday was the 103rd birthday of Grand Canyon National Park. And I posted something about it on Facebook. I think it was Saturday actually. And, and uh, I'm really pleased to say that I have long ago lost count of how many times I've been somewhere within the landscape of Grand Canyon. So I'm really happy to talk about it. And my talk is called Young Canyon Old Rocks. And if you were to stop right now and leave the talk, if you could just remember those four words, Young Canyon Old Rocks, then you will learn something really important about Grand Canyon. Because that really, if you had to summarize what Grand Canyon is all about in the shortest phrase possible, that's probably about it. Grand Canyon is a geologically young canyon that's been carved through geologically old rocks. And so I'm going to tell the story of Grand Canyon. And since the rocks are much older than the canyon, we start with the rocks and then we finish up sort of with the canyon that exposes them. So Grand Canyon is the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River, the primary river of the southwestern United States that rises on the western slope of the Rockies and flows down through uh, 
states like Wyoming and Utah and Colorado and down into Arizona, uh, a little bit into New Mexico and then Utah and, and then out to uh, Nevada and California. So <clears throat> when people think of Arizona, if you're not from Arizona, if you haven't been to Arizona, you think about Arizona, a lot of people envision that the whole state is flat and sandy and a, and a harsh desert. But actually, uh, Arizona is one of the most topographically diverse states in the United States. Um, the northern half of, of, of Arizona is actually pretty high in elevation. What you see here is a relief map from the US Geological Survey that's color coded. So the high elevations are in green and the low elevations are in brown. And the topography, the lay of the land of Arizona is commonly divided into three main regions. Um, in the south part of the state, we have what's called the Basin and Range. That's where I am right now. I'm right over here. Phoenix is located over here in the traditional homelands of the Acamela Autumn and Peeposh people. The northern part of Arizona is called the Colorado Plateau. Plateau means high and flat and Colorado because of the Colorado River flowing through it. Most of the elevations in northern Arizona are more than a mile above sea level. And it's a semi-desert. It's, it's a true desert down south. It's a, still dry up north, but it's a little bit less of a harsh desert, a little bit more precipitation. Then we have something called the transition zone in the middle that has kind of a little bit of both regions. The Grand Canyon carves through the Colorado Plateau and you can see it very vividly on this map over here. It's a very, very prominent landscape feature. It rises in the Rocky Mountains. It comes down through the Colorado Plateau and then it exits over here, which is the edge of the Colorado Plateau and the start of the Basin and Range. So Grand Canyon is 277 river miles long. We usually consider the start to be up here at Lee's Ferry, Arizona. That's called mile zero. And then 277 miles later, the river emerges at the Grand Wash Cliffs, which is the edge of the Colorado Plateau and out into the low deserts of the Basin and Range in northwesternmost Arizona. And then a short distance later, it flows past Las Vegas. Um, this dark area over here is Lake Mead. That's the artificial reservoir that's built by a, a Colorado River backing up behind Hoover Dam. Um, there are dams at both ends. You can see up at this end too, a little bit of the, uh, of the uh, Glen Canyon Dam and the, uh, the uh, Lake Powell, which is at the other end. So there, there are two artificial reservoirs that are either end of Grand Canyon. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later because that has a pretty significant influence on the way the river flows today. But Grand Canyon's long. Um, it's also very wide. It's up to 18 miles wide in many places. And it's a little hard to appreciate that when you stand on the rim and you look down on it. But if you're actually down in the canyon on the river or you hike down into the canyon, you very quickly realize how large a landscape it is and how far apart the north and south rim really are. They can be separated by as much as 18 miles in many places. And the canyon itself is about a mile deep. Um, the south rim of the Grand Canyon Average elevations are at about 7,000 feet above sea level. The north rim, the elevations average about 8,000 feet. So it actually cuts through a landscape in which the rocks are, are dipping or tilting to the south and the northern end is higher. Um, the bottom of Grand Canyon is anywhere from about 3,500 down to about 1,500 feet above sea level as it makes the Colorado River makes its way down toward the, the uh, Gulf of California and the sea. So for for people who might know something about the way the climate varies and the, and the uh, with geography in Arizona, we tell people that the South Rim is kind of like being at Flagstaff, Arizona, which is a, a, a city at 7,000 feet above sea level that gets snow in the winter. And it's actually pretty cold in the winter, but the bottom of Grand Canyon is like being in Phoenix. So you, you pretty much recapitulate the entire uh, climatic pattern of the state of Arizona just by going from the top to the bottom of, of Grand Canyon. Um, many people who visit Grand Canyon come to the South Rim and they'll visit um, Grand Canyon Village, which is located about 88 miles downstream. At the bottom of the canyon is Phantom Ranch. It's a very popular hike to get down there and you can ride mules down or ride mules back. And then if you want, you can hike on up to the North Rim and there's Grand Canyon Lodge on that side. And that's only about 88 miles into the 277 mile river. Uh, some people have heard of the Wallapai Skywalk, the Wallapai tribe, which has the lands on the left bank of the Grand Canyon for about the final third of its stretch. They built this amazing structure that kind of sticks out over a side canyon of Grand Canyon called the Skywalk. And that's way down here. That's almost at the other end of the canyon. So a lot of people go to the Skywalk and they don't realize that the National Park itself is, is many, many hours drive in the other direction. So it's a really big landscape. Um, I was fortunate to be part of a team that developed a, a 
self-guided geology field trip on the South Rim, which we call the Trail of Time. It's essentially a walking timeline where if you, you look carefully, you can see there are these markers in the trail. Each one of them is separated by a meter and each one of them symbolizes a million years of geologic history. So as you walk along the trail, you walk either forward or backward through time, depending on which way you go. And along the way, there are signs that illustrate the history of the Grand Canyon, the geologic history, and later the human history. Um, there are viewing tubes that allow you to look down into the canyon and, and see features that are, that are described along there. And then the really cool thing too is we collected specimens of every single kind of rock that occurs somewhere in the Grand Canyon area. And there's more than 40 of them. Now, when you're on the rim, it's pretty much all one particular kind of rock. It's called the Kaibab limestone. And it forms the entire rim, the top of the canyon. You can't see a lot of these other rocks unless you get down into the canyon itself. So we brought these rocks up for people to, to enjoy. And they're big specimens mounted on these big solid concrete plinths. So people can climb on them. They can sit on them. We've seen kids make a, crayon rubbings of them, you know, they're there for people to experience and, and enjoy. So this is here, we opened it up in 2010, and it's one of the most popular uh, spots for tourists to visit. Millions of people visit it every year when they go to Grand Canyon. And there's no substitute for being at Grand Canyon. My, my talk is really a, a very poor substitute for actually being there and really experiencing it. But I will try to bring some of Grand Canyon to you. And in the process, I will use some of the resources that we put into the Trail of Time, like these wayside signs and some of these rock samples that we've developed. So you'll see uh, so features of the, of the Trail of Time as we go along. But now let's talk about the geologic story that's recorded in Grand Canyon. Now, nobody knows who the first person who traveled Grand Canyon is, almost certainly was an indigenous person. There are 12 tribes in the Grand Canyon area that recognize Grand Canyon as their traditional homeland. And they've been there for many, many, many centuries, in some cases, many millennia. But the first documented trip was that of John Wesley Powell in the 1870s. And he and his, uh, his crew uh, bravely traveled the entire Colorado River from Green River, Wyoming, down to near where Las Vegas is today, including Grand Canyon. And he came back several times to, to do more exploration. Um, and in his, he wrote a wonderful book called Exploration of the Colorado River and His Canyons, which is actually a, a summary of, of several different trips that he took. And, and here's, I'll use his quotes in several places. And here's one that I really like. All about me are interesting geologic records. The book is open and I can read as I run. And that analogy of, of layers of rock serving as pages in a book, of course, that's a very common analogy for geologists. We think of the, the layers laid down through time as representing the pages in a book of, of earth history. Um, the complicated thing though, for people who know geology is that the book is not complete. Um, if we have a book that, that extends for the entire history of the earth, which is about four and a half billion years. So imagine a book with four and a half billion pages in it. And now more than half of those pages get torn out and they get torn out in sort of random places, not all in the same place. And then the book gets put back together again. And your job is to figure out the story when half the pages are missing. Well, that's what geologists do, right? That's we, we make inferences about the missing time by looking at what is recorded in the rocks and by applying some basic principles of how we interpret the earth to do that. So let's look into the geology of Grand Canyon. You're standing on the trail of time right now. You're looking down into the canyon. The depths of the canyon are right down here. This is the, uh, this is the inner gorge of, of Grand Canyon down below. And, uh, and crystalline rocks above that. And then you're looking progressive sets of layers all the way up to the rim. And you're standing on the south rim looking north toward the north rim in this view. And an untrained eye looks at this and says, oh, lots and lots of different layers, lots of colors. But it, it's hard maybe to recognize different patterns. But if you look carefully at what you're seeing, you can actually recognize that there are different sets of rocks visible here that have different properties. They look a little bit different. OK? so. We have a set at the bottom, at the very, very depths of the canyon, down where the river is, we have a, a group of rocks that, that have no layering at all. They're not layered. They're, there's actually kind of a, a verticality to them. There's a, there's a, 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 a sort of a, a preferred orientation that's vertical. And if we look at them closely, which we will in a moment, these are crystalline rocks. These are metamorphic and, and igneous rocks uh, made of crystals growing together. And then we have two sets of layered rocks that are sitting on top of 
those crystalline rocks. And the next set up actually is a set of layered rocks that are tilted. On the right there, you can see they're sitting directly <clears throat> on top of the crystalline rocks. I'll call those for now the tilted layered rocks. They're really beautiful kind of deep reds and oranges. And then there's this very thick stack of flat lying layered rocks that sits on the tilted layered rocks and goes all the way up to the rim. So and you can see that these rocks, in some ways, they look like the layered rocks down here, but they are not tilted. They're actually flat lying, almost perfectly flat lying. And erosion has carved its way down here and it's exposed all of these rocks almost like a staircase. And there are some places where the tilted layered rocks sit directly on top of the crystalline rocks and the flat lying rocks sit on top of them. And there are other places you can see where the flat lying rocks sit directly on the crystalline rocks with no tilted rocks in between them. So that's kind of an interesting puzzle. These tilted layered rocks are present, but they're not present everywhere. There's some places where they're missing and the flat lying rocks are sitting directly on the crystalline rocks. So that's kind of an interesting geologic story that we'll try to puzzle out in our vision, our, our trip through the Grand Canyon. So the rock record at Grand Canyon is, is, is very extensive. The oldest rocks in Grand Canyon are about 1.8 billion or 1,840 million years old. They've been dated by radiometric dating using the isotopes of uranium and lead. Um, those are the oldest ones. But then they, they continue in age all the way up to the, to the rocks that are at the rim of Grand Canyon that are about 270 million. And then there are also volcanoes in Grand Canyon that erupted into Grand Canyon that are even younger. They actually erupted after the canyon was formed because you can actually see the flows going down over the rim. Um, but the thing to note is on the right there is a, is a column that shows all of the, the ages of geologic time that are represented by the rocks in Grand Canyon. And the colors are coded to what you see in the cross-sectional diagram. The, the diagram on the left is a sort of a cross-section of all the rocks that are present when you're looking down into the canyon. And the first thing you notice is that there are a lot of areas that are black, okay? You have the blue at the bottom that represents the crystalline rocks. You have the red and the orange that represents the, the, the tilted layered rocks. And then you have blue and green again that represent the flat lying layered rocks on top. But the black in between there, the black areas represent missing time. They represent intervals of geologic time that is not represented by any rocks present in the canyon today. And so that is time. That's not to say that nothing happened during that time. But if there were any rocks that were deposited during those intervals of time, something happened to cause them to be eroded away, and so they're not present today. And those are what we call uh, unconformities, missing time. And that's an important part of the Grand Canyon story. So if we look at the entire geology of the Grand Canyon, if we sort of look at the previous slide, that's a cross section that shows all the different rocks that are present, all different rock units. And we have pieces of every single one of those rocks along the trail of time. But for our purposes, we can lump those rocks together into those same three or four groups that we talked about before. The unlayered crystalline rocks at the bottom, the tilted layered rocks at the top, and in the middle, I'm sorry, and the flat lying layered rocks that sit on top of them. We also refer to the crystalline rocks as basement rocks. Basement is a term that we use to describe rocks at the bottom of, of a stack of any rocks in the crust. Um, the rocks that are tilted are called the supergroup rocks. It's the Grand Canyon supergroup. It's a term that's used to express the fact that all of these rocks were deposited by a set of events that was pretty much consistent. And then the flat lying rocks on top of them are called Paleozoic rocks because they were all deposited during the Paleozoic era of geologic time. And you can see the ages, right? The ages of the basement rocks are from 1800 to 1400 million years ago. Then there's a gap in time. And then the supergroup rocks pick up at about 1300 million and go to about 730 million. Then another gap in time and the Paleozoic rocks pick up at about 520 and go to 270 million years old. And then on top of all of that, we have basalt volcanoes. We have relatively young volcanic eruptions that erupted and lava flow down into the area. <clears throat> and to the best of our knowledge, the canyon itself is about 6 million years old. And the basalt volcanoes started about 10 million years ago, but they continued almost to the present, which means that many of these volcanoes erupted after the canyon had already formed and the lavas flowed into the canyon. And we're gonna talk about that. That's kind of an interesting part of the Grand Canyon story. So basic principle of geology is that the rocks at the bottom are the oldest and the rocks at the top are the youngest. And that's certainly what we see here at Grand Canyon. So let's look again. And there are three sets of rocks again, the basement rocks, the supergroup rocks on top of them, 
and the Paleozoic rocks on top of the supergroup rocks. And I, you can't see any of the volcanoes in this picture. They're kind of off to the west, but I'll show you some pictures of those later. And let's start by looking at the basement rocks. Let's start with the earliest, the oldest rocks that are exposed in this geologically young canyon, right? So these are the unlayered crystalline rocks. The basement rocks are the deepest rocks in Grand Canyon, and they are also the oldest rocks. In fact, the oldest rock in the Southwest that's been dated so far, is 1,840 million years old. It's called the Elves Chasm Nice, and it's at the bottom of, of Grand Canyon in these basement rocks. Um, we can see what they look like, okay? We have pieces of these different rocks present along the trail of time, and we can see that they are of two basic types. They are metamorphic rocks. They were rocks like schist and, uh, and um, uh, nice that were formed through intense, <coughs> sorry, excuse me a second, <clears throat> exposure to intense pressure and heat deep in the crust that caused the minerals in the rock to kind of flow almost like taffy and rearrange themselves. And then there are also a lot of granites and granite is a crystalline rock with large crystals that form by magma that rose up from the depths but crystallized into a solid rock before it reached the surface. And when you look at rocks like these, these are rocks that tell us that they must have been formed, first of all, very deep in the crust, very deep, probably at least 20 kilometers below the surface, if not deeper. And under those conditions, they must have undergone enormous pressure and high heat. So these are the basement rocks. These are what the basement rocks look like when you're down at river level. And it's kind of cool. You've got these metamorphic rocks, these schists, and then you've got the granite, and the granite actually kind of interweaves with the schist. You can see there's actually a sort of a, an up and down squiggling body of the granite. And that's because the granite was injected into that schist while it was still molten, but the schist was still undergoing tremendous compressive stress. And so the granite kind of got squeezed and squoze into these, into these bands. And so when you see structure like this, it tells you that something really big happened. There must've been like on a continental scale and some kind of event that probably was associated with the formation of mountains. And the geological interpretation is that since there are no rocks older than this in Arizona, these must be the rocks that represent the origin of Arizona, the actual formation of Arizona. If we went back 1800, 1900 million years ago, and by the way, I don't use by choice, I don't use billions. I don't say like 1.9 billion. It's just easier to use millions because we, we continuously use millions throughout the entire story. So if we go back 1800 million years ago, now at that time, Minnesota was around, okay? There was a good piece of what we, at the time was a continent that we now refer to as Laurentia, which is actually sort of the predecessor of North America. But Arizona wasn't here. Arizona was ocean floor at that time. But around this time, what happened was that, that chains of islands, pieces of fragments of smaller land masses were dragged and collided with the, with the edge of the pre-existing continent by plate tectonics. The motion of the ocean floor through plate tectonics where the, where the seafloor was actually subducting or sliding underneath the edge of, of the continent and dragging these little bits and pieces of islands with it, these all eventually collided with the continent and docked with the continent to extend the landmass out and fill out the great state of Arizona. And in the process, since this was a very intense collision, we had a lot of stress and we threw up gigantic mountains. Now, this is what we think happened 1800 million years ago when Arizona was being formed. We do have a modern day analogy for this. You only have to look at the Pacific Northwest up around British Columbia and Northern Washington. There are some large islands that are on their way to docking with North America there. Or just look at Indonesia on the other side of the planet. Indonesia looks a lot like what you see here, right? It's a bunch of chains of, of islands that are gradually merging together and eventually will collide with Asia and make Asia bigger. So if we look at this in cross section, and again, this is an illustration from the trail of time, this shows what's happening, that the process of plate tectonics through the subduction of ocean floor was dragging small land masses like island chains and little pieces of continents together, finally bringing them together, colliding with the edge of the continent and forming what we call the Vishnu Mountains because they're named for the Vishnu Schist, which is one of the main rock types that was formed at this time. And this is the origin of the basement. The basement was formed in the heart of great mountains that were thrust up at the time when Arizona was first being assembled. The thing is, there's no longer any trace of those mountains. We know from the kinds of minerals that are present in the rock and the structure of the rock, 
that these rocks must have been formed at least 20 kilometers beneath the surface at the time. So there were 20 more kilometers of crust on top of these rocks, making these giant mountains, which have all been stripped away now. And the rocks that you're looking at today in Grand Canyon correspond to the rocks you see with those two red arrows in the cross section at lower left. See where those arrows are. That dotted line indicates the present day top of the basement rocks, which is actually at the bottom of Grand Canyon. And so that's what you're looking at here. You're looking at rocks that were formed by violent and slow collisions of many, many different little bits of land to gradually assemble the continent like a, like a jigsaw puzzle or another analogy is like a very, very, very slow chain collision on the freeway where one car after another comes in. It's a collision that took over 400 million years to, to complete. But eventually, the basement was assembled and the crust of Arizona was, was intact and complete. Now, after the basement was formed, again, about 1800 to 1400 million years ago, um, those mountains were high for a time. But the thing about mountains are they never last forever. Erosion is always at work. Anytime you take a landmass and thrust it up into the sky by making mountains, there's always going to be surface processes of flowing water and ice and wind that are going to grind away at them. And eventually the highest mountains get worn down to nothing. And that's what happened here. <clears throat> because we know the basement was originally 20 to 25 kilometers deep. But today, it's a surface upon which younger rocks were deposited. And that happened in the interval between about 1400 million and about 1300 million or 1000 million in some places. These are all time intervals in a, in a piece of geologic time that we call the Proterozoic Eon which ended about 542 million years ago. That's with the MA, if you're not familiar with the MA, that stands for mega annum, which means millions of years ago. Okay, so now we got to step ahead because we're entering one of those gaps in geologic time between the basement to the next set of rocks, okay? The next set of rocks are the supergroup rocks, the tilted layered rocks that sit on top of the basement rocks. But the thing about the supergroup rocks is you don't see them very much in Grand Canyon. They're there, but in most places, they're buried, and you can't see them. They're covered by the Paleozoic rocks, and only a small exposure is visible. So when you're standing on the South Rim and looking up at the North Rim and looking at those supergroup rocks, you see what looks like a pretty thick section, but you're actually missing most of those rocks because, as you can see from this diagram, most of them are concealed by the overlying Paleozoic rocks that came later on. And it turns out that if you took those supergroup rocks and you tilted them back up vertically so they were flat lying, they would be thicker than the overlying Paleozoic rocks are. So they represent a long interval of geologic time where a lot of sediments were being deposited. But again, you don't see them much anymore because they're covered up by later stuff. The other thing too is the fact that they're tilted is kind of interesting because there's a sort of a basic principle of geology that sedimentary rocks are always laid down horizontally in the beginning. But these rocks, since we're going to see, are actually also layers of sedimentary rocks like sandstone and limestone. They must have originally been laid down horizontally, but then something must have happened to tilt them. And that something happened after the basement rocks were formed, but before the Paleozoic rocks were formed, because the Paleozoic rocks are not tilted. So the tilted supergroup rocks, which we can see in this diagram on the right over here, are about 1300 to 730 million years old. And while they are very thick, they're only actually visible and exposed in just a relatively few parts of Grand Canyon. Most of Grand Canyon, you can't see them because they're buried under the Paleozoic rocks. But um, this photo was taken from a section of the Trail of Time where you can pretty much see all the rocks. And that's why I like to, to show this picture. So this is what they look like from above. Again, you see the arrow pointing to them. They're tilted. The layers are, are dipping down to the right. And they're these sort of beautiful colors of red and brown. When you come down to river level, this is what they look like. Okay, And they are layers primarily of sedimentary rocks like limestone and mudstone and sandstone. But in a few places, you have dikes. You have diabase dikes. This, is, this picture on the right is one of the, uh, one of the most classic localities in Grand Canyon, and that photo is graced the pages of almost every introductory geology textbook that's ever been published. And that is a, that is a black dike of diabase, which is very similar to basalt, that's cutting through these flat-lying layers of mudstone and limestone uh, in the supergroup rocks. 
And so mostly sedimentary rocks, but a few igneous rocks as well. And this is what these rocks look like at, on the trail of time. And there are a few things to, to recognize. Like for example, the, the rock at the upper left, the Shinamu sandstone, okay? Notice it's rippled. The top of that rock specimen is rippled and ripples are formed by flowing water. So there must've been water flowing over the landscape at the time when that sediment, that sand was deposited and was later buried and turned into sandstone. The dock sandstone in the middle, what you're looking at there are mud cracks, ancient mud cracks. Mud cracks form when you get a fine grain sediment that's you know, like mud, it gets wet. And then when it dries out, it shrinks and it, it cracks and you form cracks. You can see that in, in dirt roads today. So again, both of these are evidence that there must've been flowing water. Another piece of evidence of that is the lower left. And the lower left is my favorite rock in all of Grand Canyon. It's called the Hotada conglomerate. It's a 1200 million year old conglomerate. It's a sedimentary rock that's made of cemented pieces of, of other types of rock. And it's usually gravel from a stream bed that was cemented together. And what's cool about the Hotada conglomerate is it's the oldest sedimentary rock in Grand Canyon. It's all of those pieces, those clasts that make up the conglomerate are all pieces of basement rock because there was nothing there except basement rock to be made out of at that time. So all those clasts are granite and schist and maybe a little bit of chert and so on. Really pretty rock. But there's also limestone, bass limestone. And of course, limestone is deposited underwater, under the sea. So there must have been seas covering this area at certain times as well. And then the Hakatai sandstone at the right, again, has ripple marks. Up at the upper right, that's the Cardinus basalt. That's one of the igneous rocks that, that intrudes into these, uh, into these layers. So how did this happen? Well, how did we get these sort of localized deposits and how they get tilted? The interpretation we have is that they formed in basins, in rift basins. They formed in, a, in an episode of geologic uh, history here where the crust was not being squeezed, but was rather being pulled apart. The crust was being stretched and pulled apart and the upper part of the crust broke apart into brittle blocks and some of the blocks dropped down, made basins and some of the blocks stayed up. And so the blocks that formed basins were catchments for sand and mud and lime and the occasional lava flow. And so they filled up with these sediments, but as these, these rifts opened up, as the crust got wider and wider, these basins would drop successively deeper and deeper. The crust would drop down like, a, like essentially a, a piece of paper in between two books. And as it dropped, it would, it would dip more and more steeply because one side typically goes down faster than the other. And so that accounts for the tilting. The tilting was actually happening pretty much at the same time that the deposition was going on. So we had this interesting event where we were opening up these little valleys, if you will, these little structural basins in the crust. And how could that have happened? Well, we think it has everything to do with another really big thing that was happening in the world at that time, and that was the assembly of a supercontinent. If you're familiar with plate tectonics, you know that continents drift across the surface because they're carried by moving plates. And every so often in Earth history, those continents are all brought together. They all bump into each other and they will, they will suture to form a giant landmass that we call a supercontinent. And that's happened several times in Earth history. And at this time, we think there was one going on that we call Rodinia, supercontinent Rodinia. And you can see where Arizona is located in Rodinia on the map on the left. You can see it's sort of on the lower left-hand side, the, the Western coast, if you will, although it wasn't actually West, um, the Western coast of, uh, of North America. And uh, sorry, it's, it's called Rodinia, it's called uh, Laurenti at that time. And uh, that collision, what was happening is at the time that these different land masses were coming in and colliding with, uh, with Rodinia coming with ancient Arizona, they were squeezing the crust and they were forcing the crust to kind of stretch laterally and open up these basins. It was the, the inland side of a great mountain range that was rising at that time that we call the Grenville Mountain Range. So these rocks tell us that uh, the rock, that the sediments were being deposited in this very dynamic environment where large land masses were coming together and the crust was being simultaneously uplifted in some places and stretched in others. So <clears throat> the supergroup has two different types of rock. It has the upper supergroup and the lower supergroup. And I, I showed you the lower supergroup rocks. The upper supergroup rocks look kind of different. The upper supergroup rocks are almost all limestone. There's very little mudstone or sandstone, and they have their own interesting features because this, like, for example, this, 
Awatubi limestone in the middle, that interesting structure you see, those are, um, those are essentially, uh, those are what we call stromatolites. Those are, are the fossils of ancient microbial colonies, which I'll, I'll show you more about in just a moment. But these rocks are mostly limestones. So what this tells us is, and, and this is what they look like in, in, in outcrop. This is a place called the Chuar Valley, and this is where we see these rocks. They're not as red as the other ones, which means they were probably not deposited under the air. They were deposited under the water instead. And they piled up in much thinner layers. And to a geologist, the story of that is that they were probably deposited under a more or less continuous sea. They were deposited in basins that formed when Rodinia, which had already been assembled at the time of the lower supergroup, was now coming apart again. So Rodinia was pulling apart. And as it pulled apart, the crust got stretched and opened up into these sort of shallow depressions where the seawater came in. And it filled these basins primarily with lime that became limestone. And the area where Grand Canyon is today was one of these areas where this, this sea came in. This is about 770 million years ago. So what's really cool about this is that these rocks, the supergroup rocks, they encode the entire history of a supercontinent. The lower supergroup rocks tell us when Rodinia came together, and the upper supergroup rocks tell us when Rodinia came apart. And at this time in Earth's history, we're talking about 750 to maybe about a thousand million years ago. Life on Earth was very simple. It was basically single celled organisms only. It was microbes. It was cyanobacteria. They had the whole planet to themselves. And so the way they preferred to live is they formed these colonies that are called microbialites. And they, they're essentially piles of, of sheets of bacteria that, that form these sort of thin films and then they would capture mud as the sea flowed over them and they would build up these layers of, of mud and organic matter. And, and they were large colonies of, of, of essentially microbes. And fossilized remnants of these are seen in the, super, in the upper supergroup rocks today. And you see two pictures down there. One is called Boxonia. These are two different species of, of microbialites. And the Boxonia uh, stromatolites are cool because they tended to form these characteristic large round balls that look nothing more than like giant brains. Okay, there's a rock hammer for scale there. So you see how big these things are. These microbes form these giant balls of mud and organic matter that when they fossilize, they look, they look like giant brains. So we call that the brain bed. But another variety, another species of, or actually another genus of, of stromatolites we call Inzeria, instead of balls, they form sheets. And so you can see there are these sort of parallel sheets. There's a pen down there for scale. And you can see that these sheets are kind of lumpy and bumpy. These were the little microbial colonies that formed. And today, stromatolites are pretty rare because once larger organisms evolved, they like to eat the stromatolites. And so the only places you find stromatolites today are in very secluded and protected marine environments. Like the picture you see up there, that's um, Shark Bay in Australia. It's one of the few places where you can see living stromatolites today. That's how we know what these things look like. So these rocks are recording the fossils of some of the earliest forms of life on the planet. And as I said before, the depositional history of the supergroup, the lower supergroup and the upper supergroup spans the entire history of supercontinent Rodinia. At the start when Rodinia was coming together, then there was about 300 million years where the continent sat rather peacefully and calmly and stayed together and then came apart again. And they came apart about 750 million years ago. And that's the upper supergroup. So that brings us to the end of the supergroup. And I should check in, Dave, is the, is the sound still good? Sound is great, going great. We're hearing you well. Good, thanks. Because we're we're now into the next stage. And since I'm not looking at the chat, if, if the sound were to go out for some reason, I might, I might never know. So I needed to check. Thank you. All right. So the next group of rocks on top of the supergroup rocks are the flat lying layered rocks or the Paleozoic rocks. They lie atop the supergroup rocks where the supergroup rocks are present. And where the supergroup rocks are not present, they lie directly on the basement rocks. So we got rocks that that started about 500 million years old sitting on top of rocks that are far, far older, which is kind of an interesting story in itself too. And the Paleozoic rocks, those are the things that, that really stick out when you look into Grand Canyon, because the majority of your view when you're looking into the canyon 
is those Paleozoic rocks, that very, very thick stack, almost a mile thick of these flat-lying layered rocks, sandstone, limestone, these sorts of things. But if you look at the bottom of the picture here, you can actually see a place where sort of a flat slab of the bottommost flat-lying rocks are sitting directly on top of the basement rocks. We know it's not the supergroup rocks because you see it's flat-lying, it's not tilted. Right? There's this horizontal slab sitting directly on top of the basement rocks there. We can zoom in on that. We can hike down into the canyon and get a close look at that. And what we find is that the rock sitting on top is called the Tapit Sandstone, and it's been dated about 508 million years old, and it's sitting directly on basement. And in this case, the basement is not just the basement, it's the oldest basement. It's the Els Chasm Nice, which dates to 1840 million years ago. And that surface where the sandstone is sitting directly on Elves Chasm Nice, that represents 1,200 million years of missing time, almost 1,300 uh, missing years of, I'm sorry, it is more, in this case, it is 1,300, other places where it's 12. So it's actually 1,332 million years of missing time in this place, uh, of missing time, which is really tremendous. And this is what we call the great nonconformity. And unconformity is any surface where much younger rocks are sitting on top of much older rocks. And in this case, that's about as a great a time difference as you can see anywhere in North America. And this tells us that these basement rocks were exposed at the surface at the time when the Paleozoic rocks were being deposited. And there may have been other rocks that were deposited in between there, because we know in other places there are supergroup rocks that bracket that time difference. But here, if there were any rocks deposited in that interval between 1840 and 508, they're long gone. They've been removed. They're gone. So this is one of the cool things about Grand Canyon. Not only does it record enormous lengths of geologic history, it also records this, these wonderful features that show how much is actually missing right, in, in these things. And this is, this is the great nonconformity. Um, but the Paleozoic rocks, it's a big, thick stack, and they're flat layers of primarily limestone, mudstone, and sandstone. Okay, here's what they look like on the Trail of Time. These are sort of more familiar rocks, I think, to people if you've been to the Southwest. They're red shales and red sandstones and kind of gray limestones and a few white sandstones in some places. But these are all sedimentary rocks, and these are all rocks whose sediments are very typical of environments that were either under the sea or very close to the sea. And the presence of these rocks and the fact that they're flatlined tells us that at the time when they were being deposited, Arizona, including the place where Grand Canyon is today, must have been relatively low lying and, and pretty flat. And so seas rise and fall through natural cycles of glaciation and deglaciation. The climate warms up, glaciers melt, the sea level goes up, climate cools down, glaciers freeze, the sea level goes down. So during times of high sea level, we got lime and mud deposited where Grand Canyon is, and they became limestone. And then during periods of low sea level, it got drier. And so we had deserts and we had sand deposited in those same places. And so we would get these alternating beds of lime and sand. And in the case of, of Grand Canyon, at this time, there was also a mountain range to our Northeast, which is no longer with us. It's in the place where the modern day Rocky Mountains are, but it's an early version of the Rocky Mountains that was present at that time, but is since been worn away and replaced by the modern day Rockies. We call that the ancestral Rockies. And the ancestral Rockies were a, a nice source for sediments that would have been shed by rivers that probably flowed down into this area. Interestingly enough, there was also a big mountain range on the other side of the continent, a much bigger mountain range that was forming called the Appalachian Mountains. That was from a continental collision on the far side. And even though that was on the other side of the continent, that was a big enough mountain range that some of the sediments from the Appalachians actually made it as far as the Southwest too. So during this time interval and even afterwards, we had this steady accumulation of sediments on top of the older supergroup and basement rocks. And so all through the Paleozoic era and on into the Mesozoic era, the next interval of geologic time, we had layer upon layer upon layer of sediment accumulating on top of the old surface. And they piled on each other, they compressed each other, and they were gradually cemented into rock. Now, the thing is we're going to see is that today, we don't see any rocks younger than the Paleozoic rocks. We're pretty sure that younger rocks were present, but they're no longer here because they've been eroded away for reasons that I'm gonna to refer to in a very short period of time. But we think that 
earlier on in, in the history of the area where Grand Canyon is now, the thickness of these layered rocks was probably twice what it is today. And those rocks were removed. Now, sedimentary rocks always have fossils in them, like the ones we talked about before. But now, these fossils are encoding the appearance and evolution of increasingly complex life. We're now at a time when animals appeared, and animals got increasingly more complex. And so we had worms. There's some worm burrows in the left there. My finger is pointing to the way that this sand is all full of little tubes and holes. This was wet sand that was basically run through by, by thousands and thousands of, of worms. They left behind the tunnels. The worms are gone, but the, the tubes they made remain. Uh, one of the more common seafloor creatures at that time was the trilobite, a small uh, uh, creature that crawled along the bottom of the seafloor. And we have trilobite fossils from that time. Um, plants got more complicated too. We had ferns, we had conifers, and here's a fern fossil from these rocks at the lower left. And as we went farther along in geologic time, we started to get more and more complex land dwelling animals. And this is the Coconino sandstone at the lower right. This shows fossil tracks of a, of a mammal like reptile, which was called Calicnus. It's the ancestor of the mammals, and it lived at a time just before the dinosaurs occurred. What a lot of people don't know is that <clears throat> mammals and dinosaurs pretty much emerged at the same time, but the dinosaurs got the upper hand for a good part of geologic history until they got done in by an extinction. They, they were a much more dominant life form. Mammals remained small and seclusive until the dinosaurs were done in by the, the end of Mesozoic uh, mass extinction. But you can see these fossils are a lot more complex than the microbial stromatolite fossils you saw in the supergroup rocks. So now we've pretty much gotten to the top of the Grand Canyon. We've laid down most of the rocks but there's a really important question we got to answer. And that is, these rocks were all deposited at or near sea level, right? They had to have been. They're, they're marine rocks. They were laid down on beaches. They were laid down on shallow sea floors and even in some places, deep sea floors. But today, the north rim of the Grand Canyon is 8,000 feet above sea level. How in the world were they lifted so high? How'd they get up there? Okay, well, the answer is plate tectonics. And what we think happened was, starting about 80 million years ago. Okay, so there was a lot of deposition that went on until about 80 million years ago, but about 80 million years ago, the ocean floor, the ancient Pacific ocean floor was subducting, was sliding under the edge of the North American continent. And what happened was it, it started to go shallow, probably because there was a piece of crust that was a little less dense, a little more buoyant. And so it scraped along the bottom of the continent, that diagram you see on the left where it says Laramide orogeny, that was the event. It lifted up the entire western edge of the continent and it took those rocks that were deposited at low elevations on a flat surface and hoisted them thousands and thousands of feet into the air. And the entire southwest at that time would have been very high and very mountainous and very rugged. And there would have been a lot of volcanic activity toward the end of it as well. And so future Grand Canyon, which was at or near sea level, for most of its pre-existing history was in a relatively short geologic event lifted up to high elevation. And so the entire Southwest was, was high elevation and rugged. And um, Arizonans always get a kick out of this. At this time, the, the highest area of mountains is called the Mogollon Highlands and it's actually in Southern Arizona. Now today, Southern Arizona is low and Northern Arizona is high, but at this time, Southern Arizona was actually higher than the future Colorado Plateau where Grand Canyon is today. That area has since dropped down for, for reasons that I'll get to in a short time. But at this time now, the entire Southwest, as well as most of the Western United States, you can see from this map, this is a paleogeographic map that shows what we think was going on at that time, um, was all being lifted high. And so the future Southwest was lifted high. And as it was lifted, erosion starts planing off the rocks on top of the stack. And as it goes up, the upper stuff gets planed off and planed off. And this accounts for why the younger rocks are no longer present at Grand Canyon. During the time when the Colorado Plateau and all of the Southwest was being uplifted, these younger rocks were being eroded away as they came up. And all of the Mesozoic rocks, which would be all the rocks that had any dinosaur fossils, were completely stripped away from Grand Canyon. So a lot of visitors to Grand Canyon, when we tell them about all the wonderful fossils that are there, they get excited. And then they get kind of disappointed because there are no dinosaur fossils at Grand Canyon. None of the rocks that remain at Grand Canyon are young enough to contain 
dinosaur fossils. But you don't have to go far. You just go north of Grand Canyon into southern Utah, or you go northeast into Colorado or east into New Mexico, and you will find plenty of dinosaur fossils. So they're there. They're just not at Grand Canyon. So this is kind of a capsule view of what was going on at this time. First, the Southwest got lifted up, and then a lot of volcanoes started erupting. And then basically about 15 million years ago, the southern end of the Southwest sort of gave up the ghost and it had been riding high, but now it kind of collapsed. And as it collapsed, it kind of tumbled down to make the modern day basin and range landscape we see today. And that started about 30 million years ago. So about 30 million years ago, we got this profound separation in the topography of Arizona, where the whole state was at high elevation before this. Starting about 30 million years ago, the southern part of the state dropped down, basically collapsed of its own weight after that flat slab underneath it stopped holding it up. Whereas the northern part of the state, the Colorado Plateau did not collapse. It stayed at high elevation. And so that set up a gradient. That set up a gradient, which made it possible for the Colorado River to flow. The Colorado River, which today rises in the, in the western slope of the Rockies, was formed as a river cut its way up headward from the Gulf of California and gradually carved its way through the Colorado Plateau, linking up some smaller segments that may have been present earlier at the time when the mountains were there. You might have had some smaller canyons there. But the entire Grand Canyon really didn't form until about 6 million years ago. At this time, now all of the river, the river had made its way up to the Colorado Plateau from the Gulf of California, and it connected some older canyon segments and cut through and started cutting up into Utah and up into Colorado. And so the modern day Colorado River was established, we think, about 6 million years ago, which means that Grand Canyon is only 6 million years old. It really is a geologically young canyon that was cut through old rocks. And this is one of the signs we have on the trail of time. And we have evidence for this because we have rocks that are only a few million years old, older, I should say, than the Grand Canyon that have been carved through by the Grand Canyon. We can date the rocks that the canyon is cut through. And we have a lot of independent lines of geological evidence that point to the Grand Canyon being only about 6 million years old, which is kind of exciting, okay? One more thing to talk about, and that's what happened pretty much after Grand Canyon was cut, and that was eruption of volcanoes. That's sort of the last bit, and spring deposits. Because starting about the time when the Colorado Plateau was uplifted and continuing pretty much into the present day, we had a lot of volcanic activity all across the state of Arizona. It's a very colorful map, right? This is a map of, of Colorado showing the, uh, sorry, of uh, Arizona, showing the locations of all the different volcanic areas. And you can see that almost the entire state was subject to volcanic activity at some point, but different time intervals. And the, the, the volcanoes in red are the ones we're most concerned in here. These are the ones that are the youngest. They're less than 4 million years old. And there was an entire volcanic field up where Grand Canyon is that erupted, started erupting after Grand Canyon itself was carved out. And so we have areas where volcanoes erupted into Grand Canyon. Um, we also have one volcano called Sunset Crater, which is over near Flagstaff, Arizona. That's the youngest volcano in Arizona that erupted in the year 1082. That was witnessed by the Hopi people who live there, and they still talk about it today. So some of these volcanoes are young enough that they erupted into Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon was already there, and lava flows would pour down into the canyon, and they would actually pile up to the brim. They formed these dams. They formed natural dams that would back up the river all the way up into Utah for thousands of years at a time until eventually the river rose to the level where it overtopped the dam. Once that happened, it would start to erode away the dam very quickly. And so all through the Grand Canyon, you see places where these lava flows went down into the canyon. You can see evidence that they formed dams, but the dams are now removed. But that's not to say they don't still have any effect on the river because places where these lava flows occurred, you get some of the wildest rapids in Grand Canyon because you still have bits and pieces of lava that sit in the, in the channel. And in particular, this is a cool place. This is a cinder cone volcano, which is called Vulcan's Throne, which erupted about 75,000 years ago. And the lavas flowed down into the canyon and built several dams through several episodes of eruption. And the river has removed those dams, but 
little remnants are down there and they create what's generally known as the most fearsome rapid on the entire river called Lava Falls, which is, which is really quite a significant rapid. And if you've, ever, if you've ever rafted Grand Canyon, you probably never forget Lava Falls. It's a pretty exciting ride. So when you're down at river level, this is what it looks like. So I took this picture one time when I was down in, in, on a raft on the Grand Canyon. Look at that wall of lava. That's one gigantic wall of basalt lava that originally filled the entire canyon from side to side until the river eventually cut through and left behind this remnant. So this was one heck of a thick slab of lava that poured down into the canyon. And we see this in many places in the Western Grand Canyon. And uh, so this basalt lava flow filled the canyon and then the Colorado River cut its way through it because rivers are dynamic and no, no obstacle placed in the path of a river will last forever. And good old John Wesley Powell had a great quote when he saw this in 1875. This is how he described it. I love this quote. What a conflict of water and fire there must have been here. Imagine a river of molten rock running down into a river of melted snow. Isn't that a great quote? I mean, that, that just encapsulates it. River of lava, river of melted snow. It would have been pretty spectacular to watch if you had been able to see that. So we have these young lava flows in the canyon. We also have rocks that are formed owing to the, uh, the effect of groundwater. Um, a lot of people don't recognize that, that Grand Canyon actually is a very, very wet environment. Even though it flows through a desert, we have the river flowing at the bottom, but we also have sedimentary rock layers that form really good aquifers, particularly the limestone, because the groundwater actually carves out caverns and passageways through the limestone, through the redwall limestone in particular, which is about 320 million years old, and it forms these, these gigantic caverns. And so the canyon came along and basically sliced through the middle of these aquifers. And so we have many places where the sea, where the spring water is just issuing out of the sides of the canyon. And so for ancient people who lived there, this was a really nice water source for, for people to use. But you had to be careful because as my, my good friend and colleague, Lori Crossy, who's a great Grand Canyon geologist and an expert in spring water at Grand Canyon, she recognized there are actually two sources of groundwater in Grand Canyon. One is from rainfall, rainfall and snow that hit the surface and then percolate down into the aquifers from above. And that gives you really nice, yummy, sweet water that she calls upper world water. That's water that's, that's filtered by these rocks and starts out as rain and snow. So it's really yummy. And Grand Canyon makes it available for people all around the canyon. There are places where you can fill your bottles with pure and clean Grand Canyon spring water. It's really yummy. But there's actually another source for water too. There are waters that come from deeper in the crust that are sourced, some of, the, some of the gases in those waters actually come all the way from the Earth's mantle. And she calls these lower world waters. And you can see that picture on the lower left. These are grungy waters. These are waters full of different salts and, and metals and so on. And they're really fascinating because they do tell a story about the, the origin of, of uh, the Grand Canyon because they tell us something about the chemistry of the crust and mantle below there. But straight out of the ground, these waters are not very yummy to drink. But one of the interesting thing is where they mix, where the upper world waters and lower world waters mix, you have preferential deposition of travertine. Travertine is freshwater limestone, where the spring water comes out of the limestone and gets an extra dose of carbonation from the lower world waters. Then when it reaches the surface, the carbon dioxide essentially outgasses from the water and it leaves behind these gigantic layers of really young limestone, which is called travertine. You might be familiar with it because it's a common rock that's used for uh, counters and walls and so on. It's very decorative, but it's a freshwater limestone that forms as spring deposits. And because the springs are still flowing, that means that even today, new rocks are forming in Grand Canyon all the time. So there are mostly old rocks, but the fact is there are also a few young rocks there as well that are forming, if you know where to look. So that pretty much brings us to human history. And we know for a fact that at least 12 Native American tribes have lived in Grand Canyon for many, many millennia. Their ancestors and the modern day tribes live there. Um, there are actually 12 traditionally associated tribes of Grand Canyon that the Park Service uh, is working with. And um, throughout the history of the park, the tribes have mostly the tribe's interests and the tribe's knowledge has unfortunately been rather sort of shunted to the side by the National Park Service, but that's not true anymore. The Park Service is now 
engaging with these tribes to try to bring their knowledge to the fore in exhibits at Grand Canyon and also uh, make decision making at the park more of a collaborative effort where the tribes have a say in the actual planning and decision making at Grand Canyon National Park. So, so there's a lot of reconciliation going on right now, which I'm happy to report with the, with the indigenous people because the Havasupai, the Wallapai, the Hopi, the Paiutes, they all still live there. They live right in Grand Canyon or very close to it. The, Nav the Navajo, the Zuni, the Yavapai and Apache live very close by as well. All of these lands are not only traditional lands of these tribes, they are still very much inhabited by modern day tribe people today. So they're still very much vibrant communities. Um, and then Grand Canyon National Park, 103 years ago was formed, 1919. Um, magnificent jewel of the national park system visited by more than 4 million people every year. Um, and I can't really say anything about Grand Canyon without pointing out that it's, it's on the Colorado River. And whereas the Colorado River is the predominant river in the American Southwest, it is no longer anything that resembles a free flowing river because the water is used, the water, the, the, Grand, the Colorado River system, including all of its tributaries that you see in the map on the left, provides water for about 40 million people in, in all of these Western states, including my home state of Arizona. We, we depend on the Colorado River for a great deal of our water. And it's a highly regulated river. There are dams and reservoirs all the way up and down its length. One of the only stretches that don't have any dams is Grand Canyon, and that's a good thing. There was actually a time, believe it or not, earlier in the 20th century where people were actually proposing to build dams in Grand Canyon. Thank goodness that never happened. But that illustration on the right is kind of a cute one. It comes from the journal High Country News and it shows the Colorado River system as a series of pipes and reservoirs. The reservoirs are little tanks that the funnels are the headwaters of the river and the pipes show which way the rivers go. And so in this illustration, Grand Canyon is this little segment of pipe right here between Lake Powell upstream and Lake Mead downstream. And it is true when you raft the Colorado River the experience you have, how much water is there, is typically determined by how much water they're letting out of Glen Canyon Dam upstream on a given day. And again, John Wesley Powell put it very succinctly. He said, I tell you, you're piling up a heritage of conflict and litigation of water rights, for there's not sufficient water to supply the land. He recognized that, that the desert is going to run into this problem of water availability. And we're seeing it right now in the Southwest. We had this tremendous population growth. People come to Arizona because they enjoy the climate. People have come to uh, farm. People have come to raise cattle. People have come to mine. People have come to retire. And the population grows, but the water availability is not getting any bigger. And in fact, it's decreasing owing to short-term climate change, human-driven climate change. So there's going to be a reckoning. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be part of the people in Arizona that are trying to, to make recommendations. I'm not, I'm not a decision maker by any chance, but one of my jobs is to help teach people about the limitations of water resources in the Colorado River and how we're going to have to deal with that if we're gonna to continue to have sustainable societies in the Southwest. The Colorado River has been called the American Nile because it's a lot like the Nile River, right? It rises in wet areas, then it flows through the desert and provides water to a, a large and arid region. So there you have it. That pretty much brings us to the modern day Grand Canyon. Um, if you'd like to look at more things, you can maybe take a screenshot or take a picture of this slide here. These are some websites that I think you'll find interesting. The first is the website of Grand Canyon National Park. And then the Trail of Time, we have our own website for that. Um, there's a wonderful little book that my colleagues, Carl Carlstrom and Lori Crossy, who are sort of the original Trail of Time designers published called the Trail of Time Companion. It only cost $15. And pretty much tells the whole geologic story of Grand Canyon. And then we have several websites, the virtual Grand Canyon GeoFest, uh, because of COVID, every year we used to have these uh, festivals of geology at the canyon, but because of COVID in 2020, instead of doing it live, we recorded it on YouTube and on our Facebook Live actually. And so all of those talks have been recorded. So if you go to this website here, you can hear a whole bunch of really great recorded talks by a bunch of Grand Canyon experts on the history and geology of Grand Canyon. And yeah, I have one talk on there as well. And then at ASU, we also developed this amazing virtual field trip. You can actually visit Grand Canyon and ride the river and hike through the canyons 
from the comfort of your own home using your own laptop or um, tablet or even cell, even smartphone will work. So have a look at these websites at your leisure and you can see more of Grand Canyon. But in the meantime, two billion years of geologic history and millennia, many millennia of human history are there at Grand Canyon and ready for you to explore them. And with that, I'll say thank you very much. There is my web address. If you'd like to reach out for anything, you can contact me at that web address and my email is connected through there. But uh, thank you very much for the invitation and I will, I will uh, step out of the slides and be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Steve. That was great. And having uh, myself having had the privilege of uh, rafting through the canyon uh, four different times, um, it was a special treat. Um, we saw all of that, and there, and there really is nothing that can compare to doing that. I know. So yeah, there is nothing to compare to actually doing it. That's right. But uh, <laughs> but know. just visiting it and hiking on the rim ain't bad either. I can tell you that. Oh no, no, it isn't. Any way you can experience Grand Canyon is great. So. So uh, do we have any questions? Uh, type them in the Q&A or, well, I see one in chat here. Uh, where does the name Vishnu Schist come from? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, Clarence Dutton, one of the early Anglo geologists who followed in Powell's tracks, who did another expedition in that area. He was, he was engaged by the US Geological Survey to, to study the Grand Canyon region and publish a monograph. And, and he named, a lot of the land features in the canyon, the buttes and mesas and towers and so on. And he was, he fancied himself something of a polymath, something of a scholar. So he drew from the world's religions to name these things. So there's their their buttes, their buttes named Isis and Zoroaster and Vishnu. And the Vishnu Schist was named for uh for uh Vishnu Temple, which is one of the one of the land features that that he named at Grand Canyon. Unfortunately, you know, it's a shame because there already were indigenous names for every single one of these features, and those were sort of shoved to the side, as I said, by by uh, sort of cultural substitution. But we do there are some names. Some of the some of the rock formations, particularly in the supergroup rocks, do have the original indigenous names. And again, the park is working to to change some of the names, to, to bring back some of the traditional names. I doubt, I doubt that um, Vishnu Schist will ever be renamed. But So that's the reason that, that uh, Clarence Dutton drew from, from world religions because you know, Grand Canyon was such a spectacular place that was worthy of, of being named for, for all these different gods. So. so there's a couple of questions here, but uh, I'll make one of my own comments right at the moment. Um, when you draft through the Grand Canyon, I'm sure you know this, um, there are places where you can see where they dug, uh, where they did test drillings, where they were planning to put dams. Yes, yes. There are several places. There's one in, in Marble Canyon. It's the really obvious one. They Because the river, the way they were deciding it is they wanted to have the right kind of rock at river level. They needed a fairly sturdy rock that they could anchor the dam into. Some of the rock layers that are exposed in the canyon are too thin and too brittle and they wouldn't work. But one of the places was in Marble Canyon where the Redwall Limestone, the, the most prominent cliff in Grand Canyon, it's called the Redwall Limestone. It's a really thick layer of, of limestone that was deposited part of the uh, Paleozoic rocks. And, they, and that's where those tunnels are. They actually dug tunnels into the Redwall Limestone. And that was where they were going to put one of the dams. So they're going to put one of the dams in uh, Marble Canyon. And the other one was going to be fairly far downstream toward the other end of Grand Canyon. So it basically would have flooded the entire canyon. It would have looked like just more of more of Lake Powell. Um, yeah. But what I heard a compromise. The, the Sierra Club fought that, and there was what they call the Udall Compromise. The Congressman Udall from the from uh, Arizona worked out a compromise where instead of building dams, they built a coal-fired power plant um, to provide power in, in its stead, and they were able to save the Grand Canyon. But on the other hand, that power plant polluted the air for about half a century before it was uh, it was torn down two years ago. In fact, one of the arguments I heard uh, that the proponents of the dam was that it's not really the Grand Canyon because it's Marble Canyon, even though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
yeah, that would have been, oh my gosh. I mean, I can't imagine the loss if they had, if they had done that. Oh, it would have been so sad, but they didn't, so. Okay, I'll ask a few, uh, I'll read a few questions here. This is from Ronald. Given the lifespan of the solid basalt lava dams in the Grand Canyon, how long do you expect the Hoover Dam to last? Uh, I love that question. Okay, so the, the, the lava dams had varying ages. Some of them lasted a few thousand years. Some of them lasted maybe as long as 10,000 years. It partly depended on how much basalt was eroded or so was flowed into there and how porous the dam was. Some, some of the dams were kind of porous and the water could get through more quickly. So the answer is, I don't know for sure, but it's probably on the order of a few, you know, maybe maybe like five or six hundred years. I think it's been estimated at, at something less than millennium, but something more than a few centuries. Um, the advantage we have is that if we could, we could go at some expense, we could go back behind those dams and dredge out the sediment that accumulates. I mean, the real problem is that that a Glen Canyon dam upstream from there, you've got the Colorado River. Now the Colorado River, Colorado means red in Spanish. And that's because throughout its history, it was red with mud and sand that were being carried down from these sedimentary rocks. And all of that is piling up behind Glen Canyon Dam. So eventually that'll pile up to the point where the water goes over the top and then that's, that's the end of the dam. But um, they could go in, I guess, if they wanted to and dredge out some of that sediment to extend the life of the dam if they saw any need to. But I would say it's more likely that someday they may decide to take those dams out because there have been other dams in other part of the country that, that have eventually been removed because of the environmental impact they have on river ecology and on stream flow and so on. So. I wouldn't count on that happening anytime soon. So, so I would say, to answer that question, may, maybe a millennium or so, but it's quite possible that that humans might take the dam out earlier than that. There's, there's yeah. always a call to remove. I mean, there's, there's sort of a perpetual call by people to remove uh, Glen Canyon Dam in particular. The uh, the other thing I will uh, I, I was told that the Glen Canyon Dam completely changed the ecology of the river because the water is a lot colder and a lot cleaner, yes. a lot clearer than they would naturally be. That is correct. The water comes out of the dam at the bottom of the reservoir. So it's ice cold and it was in the dark. And so, yeah, so you get this alien looking dark green cold water. By the time it gets to the other end of Grand Canyon, it's pretty warm. I mean, if you go swimming in the river, if you take a river trip every night, you go swimming after, after your stretch, you know, it gets progressively warmer as you go down. That's the good thing. The bad thing is that if you're dragging your, your bags of beer behind your boat, eventually it gets to a point where the beer can't be chilled anymore because the river gets too warm. Okay, here's a question from Mike uh, related to this. Uh, Lake Mead is very low water level. How much water is in the Glen Canyon Lake Powell? Lake Powell is also historically low right now. It's both of those reservoirs are at historically low levels because we are in the throes of what some people are starting to call a mega drought, which has been going on for at least a decade now and shows no signs of, of ending. So both of those both those reservoirs are really, really low right now. Um, I don't know the actual level. I know that, that Lake Mead is very close to a level where when it gets to that level, they're gonna start cutting back water to, to many of the Western states. Arizona is gonna be the first one to feel that probably. Um, and that'll, that'll primarily hurt irrigated agriculture. Um, there's a saying in the West that, that uh, water flows uphill toward money and the urban areas have more of the money than the farmers do. So I would guess that the farmers will lose their water first and the cities will be the last to lose their water. Okay, uh, right now there's two more questions. So if anybody has more, now it's time to type them in. Uh, from Angie and Pete. Uh, here up north, we had catastrophic collapses of ice sheets that led to deep canyons. Mm -hmm. Were there any catastrophic floods or collapses that led to the Grand Canyon's huge size? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Um, the river was cutting headward from, from the Gulf of California. You had, you know, mountain ranges flowing into, I mean, I suppose, you know, the ice ages, we had a different situation. The, the ice sheets never came this far south, okay? So, we didn't have continental glaciation this far south in North America. So we wouldn't have had that, that kind of ice to be able to do that. So I would, I would guess probably not. I don't know that for sure, but I don't, I don't believe so. Uh, 
that's a great question. I mean, certainly if you go up to places like the Channel Scablands up north in, in uh, up in the northwest, um, you know that that catastrophic flood that was like you mentioned was created by by a failure of an ice dam. But that was a lot farther north where the ice sheets still were. Okay, here's a question from Claude on the south. Rim Ridge in the middle of the night, we noticed an uprushing of warm air. Is that a normal daily occurrence? Yes, yes, you get you get microclimates in the Grand Canyon, and uh, part of it is that that you know once the once the sun goes down, um, the the bottom of the Grand Canyon is going to be hotter than the top of the Grand Canyon. Right, the bottom of the Grand Canyon is low desert. The top of the Grand Canyon is ponderosa pine forest. So you'll get differences in temperature. And so, yeah, rising hot air is gonna come out of that in the end of the day. Um, wind can also sometimes sort of be funneled down there. It, it, it does kind of crazy things with that landscape, but yeah, you get, you get differential heating of the landscape during the course of the day. And that's gonna, that's gonna manifest itself as, as winds at night when those temperatures try to even themselves out. And here's a question from Ted. Can you say anything about the amount of rainfall during the six million years farming the Grand Canyon? Well, there is a good record of climate and, and overall the climate of the Southwest would have been tied into the, the broader climate of Western North America, which means that there were rainier periods and there were drier periods. There were cycles of, of wet and dry, um, which are natural cycles that, that, you know, until more recently when we started having an effect on climate on the short term, um, you would see in, in spring deposits and see in tree rings, you know, like if you look at tree rings, you know, in a wet year, you get a big ring and a dry year, you get a thinner ring. We see the same thing in spring deposits. So, so it fluctuated, you know, it was natural cycles of wet and dry during that, during those last 6 million years, um, or during the, you're talking about during the Grand Canyon. Um, yeah, same sort of thing. It wouldn't have been anything really different from the way it has until until anthropogenic uh, climate change kicked in more recently, which is now sort of overriding everything else. Okay, and I found a few more questions here in the chat um, from from Mary Helen. Since the Trail of Time presentation was put in rather recently, uh, can we assume that it is wheelchair accessible? Yes. Yes, it is. It, it follows the accessible part of the South Rim Trail. So it's completely wheelchair accessible for its entire length. So we're very proud of that. Which means there are some places where it actually kind of wanders away from the edge of the canyon a little bit because the accessible, the accessible trail doesn't always hug the canyon, but it does most of the way. But you're not very far. You can still sort of see it there. So it's, but yes, it is accessible. Okay, and right at the moment, this will be the last question, unless some more pop in. From Mary Kay, would you talk about the experiments to release water from Glen Canyon to restore the vegetation and shores of the river? Yes, there have been a number of these of these uh, high flow tests where they where they release large amounts of water from the from Glen Canyon Dam and let it flow down through Grand Canyon into Lake Mead. And the idea behind that is that the side canyons that flow into, into Grand Canyon deliver sediment down into the main area of the canyon. And then these floods would, would redistribute the sediment and build beaches. The biggest problem is that the, the Glen Canyon Dam strips the sediment away from the water of the color. So upstream, you've got a river that's, that's got its full capacity of sediment. Below that, you have a river which has almost, it's been completely stripped of sediment. We call that hungry water. And so what the river will do downstream is it will pick up sediment and it removed beaches. There were all of these wonderful sand beaches along the river that were present before the dam was built. And the, the hungry water from below Glen Canyon Dam would strip the sand away and you'd be left with these large boulder beaches, which you know wasn't great for river rafters, but it was even worse for the ecosystems, we had these all these ecosystems that had evolved to have these beaches, the beaches were no longer available. So these high flow tests, what they try to do is they try to when, when times when streams have delivered um, a significant amount of sediment into the canyon through side canyons as they send these floods down and the idea is that the floods are gonna redistribute the sediment and kind of recharge the beaches to some extent. And it, it, mixed results, I mean, the thing is that that there's no substitute for the river flowing 
naturally the whole time. I mean, you can't really recreate a natural process in fits and starts, which is kind of what they're doing. But you know, it was a it's a good attempt, and it's it's certainly better than doing nothing. So, and and they haven't done it for a while though, and I think it's just because the, the Lake, uh, Lake Powell is so low right now; they don't have any water to spare up there. So, yeah, actually, I was going to ask that very question. Do you know when when the uh, the last time they did that? I don't remember, but it's been a while. It's been a few years. Yeah, and, and I'm not surprised given that the water levels down. It'd be yeah, a while till yeah, they do I, it. I'm again, pretty I sure that I, I don't know for sure, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure um, pretty sure about that. So. Steve, this is Steve Erickson. How are you doing? Thank right, you very Steve. much for your great talk. My uh, pleasure. I'm curious about the cinder cone that got on the side. How did it manage to go straight up, so to speak, as opposed to do a lateral blast into the canyon? I mean, how far back away from the canyon wall was that, the actual vent? Do you know? That's a great question. Because, yeah, I mean, you would expect that if the vent was really, if there was only a thin layer of rock separating the vent from the edge of the canyon, I don't know if, I don't know. That's a good question. I have not studied the eruption, but there have been a number of papers published on the Uinkaret volcanic field, starting with, um, with Ken Hamblin, who did, uh, did a lot of great work in the, in the 60s and 70s. And then uh, more recently, Ryan Crow, who's a good friend of mine, who's a Grand Canyon geologist with the US Geological Survey. So I would say, you know, you can probably dig into the literature. I'm, I'm guessing there was probably, it may have been set a little farther back than it is now. There's probably been some some cutback, but that's a great question. Um, yeah, that's. I, I just I was looking at that and wondering how did it not go laterally? It would have been. It might be hit just uh, one single solid rock formation that vented it up. I mean, it directed it that way. Well, the upper part of the rim, you know, you've got you've got Coconino sandstone, which is pretty durable, and you've got uh, Kaibab limestone. So it's coming through some fairly solid layers at the top there. It's not it's not as friable as some of the stuff farther down. So. I, I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. But. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. That's great. I really appreciate that question. I wish I could, I wish I could say, um, you know, it's cool because I didn't show any pictures of it, but there, uh, you know, if you flow to the river, you know, there are places where the, the lava flow is actually completely filled in side canyons. And there's actually one place where it filled an older channel of the Colorado itself. And what the river just did was cut its way around it. So as you come down the river, you can see this gigantic filled channel of lava over your head where the river used to be flowing, which is kind of cool. So it's like an earlier, an earlier reach of the Grand Canyon that was that was filled in, and the, the river just instead of cutting through it, it just bypassed it completely. So there's so and, much wonderful, so much wonderful stuff down there. You and know, I will say, chance, you know, there are things you can do. There, are, um, oh, sorry about that. I, did I? Uh, Share it again. There's some uh, some things you can do uh, besides going to the South Rim. You know, if you want to explore, you can go out to the uh, the Western Canyon from St. George, Utah, and you can go see um, uh, Vulcan's Throne and some of the others in the Toro Weep section of the canyon. And, uh, you know, you can just go to the sky. I've never done the Skywalk, but I understand it's kind of a neat view from up there too. And uh, I saw there's a question about caves. Oh my gosh, there are caves all over Grand Canyon. All of that limestone. And all that groundwater has made lots and lots of caves. There's a place called Grand Canyon Caverns, which is actually outside the park. It's uh, near Seligman, Arizona, sort of on the south end. And you can uh, you can go down in there. I think you can actually spend the night down there. I think they actually have like a, a suite that you can rent. But there are plenty of caves in around Grand Canyon. And alcoves, places where the, the, the it collapsed so that you have like a giant room in there where they actually were ancestral Native Americans, in many cases, built uh, built their dwellings. You can still see dwellings. So if you see those, you want to keep your distance. You're not you're not supposed to go touch them, or you're supposed to enjoy them from a distance. So, and uh, one other question uh, from Ted, a follow on question: What is the current annual rainfall in, in the Grand Canyon area? Well, I don't know for sure. The northern Arizona. It's probably somewhere in the A range of about, uh, well, Phoenix is about eight inches. Flagstaff's uh, probably about 14 or 16, I think, maybe. Um, so it, it depends on different regions. But, but um, again, it's all down. I mean, we, we haven't had long-term averages for a number of years. Um, but uh, I think, like, like, like by comparison, Phoenix has been mostly in the range of three to six inches a year for the last decade or so. And uh, 
I know it's still semi-arid up there, so it's got to be less than 25 inches a year, um, or it was less than 25. It's certainly less than that now. It's probably probably in the range of the teens, I think, the low to mid teens. I'm just I'm just guessing. I don't actually know, but you can look at the National Weather Service Flagstaff uh, Flagstaff website, and they would tell you what it is for that area. Okay. It's dry. Um, <laughs> it's a desert. There's no question. Even even up there, it's wetter than it is down here, but it's still it's still arid. It's still semi-arid up there. I don't see any more questions. Um, um, the comment from Roger, Steve, this is what a great talk. <laughs> well, thank you. So, thank you. I, and, and, I, hope and I think all of us fast, uh, you know. It's it's hard to cover two billion years in an hour. <laughs> I I teach in I teach a class on geology of Southwest. It takes a whole semester to really do it justice, um, and I have to kind of skip some things and kind of rush through others. So I am glad that you know I hope it wasn't too uh, too fast. It was it was a great talk, and actually for what we what most of our people do, probably covered it just enough to give them what they wanted without getting too deep. It, it's actually uh, a good balance you had. And well, I know you can you. go on another hour, but but I think you got just the exact amount of time and space and great job. Thank you so well, much. Thanks, it was my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, you have the recording, so uh, you can uh, you can do it. Looks like we got some other people. Are there any other questions? Or I noticed there's a couple hands raised here. Let's see if I'm gonna allow Mary to talk. Yeah, I don't know if you have a verbal question or what. Mary, you have to unmute. Okay, we're not getting anything from Mary. Uh, Joni, um, you can unmute if you want. I don't know if you have something you want to say. Not getting any response from either of them. Okay. Uh, oh, one more here. Barbara, um, you can unmute if you want. Okay, maybe they're just applauding. I'm not sure. <laughs> it might be, yeah. It might be, or they're just waving or something. But no. I see someone in the um, in the chat posted 10 inches. Um, that's probably true at the South Rim. I think it's probably still a little more at the North Rim, but. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a lot less than it was, um, and that's true. Uh, that's true. Uh, oh, that, maybe that's it. Uh, maybe you. Maybe you're. There, since it's a webinar, is it that they can't unmute? Yeah, I. I thought I gave them permission to unmute, but okay. okay. Um, maybe. So, well, I appreciate all the good questions. Um, okay, and uh, I'll say we've, re as you know, we recorded this. And I also took a screenshot of uh, your slide with, with the various links on it. So oh, good, when I good. send out the recording, I'll include that screenshot for- That's good. Yeah, I would like to, I definitely want to steer people. And, you know, so, sometimes I make a few, uh, few small errors when I deliver these things. So that, those, that stuff will, uh, the, the Trail of Time Companion is really good and, and worthwhile for anybody who wants to get a copy of that. There are other, other books on Grand Canyon geology too, and they're all pretty good. But this one is the most recent, so it's got the most recent data. Okay, I think we'll end the meeting. Uh, thanks. Thank you again. Yeah, everybody have a good night, everybody. You all have a good night. Thanks for, for uh, having me, and uh, it was fun, and take care. Right, and remember to come back in two weeks. I, Steve, do you remember who's coming in two weeks? I believe it's Sheila from uh, Oregon. I think we're talking about Mount St. Helens, if I remember right, just a second. I've got something I'll pull up quick. Yeah, uh, yeah Sheila Elson will be on uh, Mount St. Helens. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're really doing a tour of the US. That's pretty cool. Yeah, we are. It's, well, that's it's, one, one advantage of Zoom. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, and and again, Sheila presented to us, I think in December last year. So she's uh, on, on Oregon also. Oh, great. Well, have a great time and uh, thanks again. I was appreciated being part of this and best of luck to you. Maybe see you at a GSA meeting or something like that down the line. Great. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.